Starten jetzt, ne? Hallo, guten Abend. Ich freue mich sehr, euch, Sie alle begrüßen zu können zu unserer heutigen ähm, Ringvorlesung. Auch hallo in den Stream. Wo muss ich eigentlich hinschauen? Da oder da? Ach, da. Okay. <lacht> Drei Kameras. Ähm, wir sind sehr froh, sehr glücklich. Heute kamen George hier zu haben. Ähm, ach so, ich mache erstmal noch kurz, wenn sowieso noch Leute reinkommen, die Formalia. Also die Headsets für, es wird wieder ein, ein Vortrag in Englisch sein, Headsets ähm, für der simultan ähm, deutsch übersetzung findet ihr hier vorne. Einfach abholen bzw. in den Zoom einwählen, dann ähm, können, kann auch die Sprache gewählt werden. Dann ähm, werden wir wieder fotografieren, wenn das macht der junge Mensch hier unten. <lacht> wenn äh, eine Person nicht fotografiert werden möchte, bitte einfach kurz Handzeichen geben. Ich äh, sehe, es ist nicht der Fall. Und ich möchte noch mal darauf hinweisen, ähm, es war bekannt, aber ja, noch wenn heute Menschen das erste Mal da sind, wir werden das Ganze live streamen. Ähm, es wird aber der Saal nicht gefilmt, sondern nur was hier vorne ähm, passiert. Ja, ich werde kurz Carmen George vorstellen. Carmen George ist a Roma Feminist, Activist and Scholar from Romania. She has been engaged in civil society for the last 21 years and her main work was focused on Roma women and girls' rights through grassroots work, community development, gender issues, intersectionality, politics of identity and rep reprodukt reproductive justice. She is the co-founder of Iromia Association, a Roma feminist NGO in Romania. <laughs> Since uh, 2018, yeah. she developed an academic course on Roma feminism and politics of identity and teach on the um, University um, of Bucharest. Das Ganze nochmal in Deutsch. Also kam George ist Rom Romani-Feministin, Aktivistin und Wissenschaftlerin aus Rumänien. Sie engagiert sich seit 21 Jahren in der Zivilgesellschaft. Sie konzentriert sich in ihrer Arbeit vor allem auf die Rechte von Romnia, ähm, beziehungsweise im Romani-Mädchen, ähm, durch Grassroots-Arbeit, Community-Arbeit, ähm, Genderfragen, Intersektionalität, Identitätspolitik und reproduktive Gerechtigkeit. Carmen ist Mitbegründerin der Eromia also ja, NGO, ich jetzt mal, einer feministischen ähm, Romnia NGO in, in Rumänien. Seit 2018 entwickelt sie einen akademischen ähm, Kurs ein, zu Romani Feminismus und Identitätspolitik und lehrt an der Universität Bukarest. Ich kenne Carmen ähm, vor allen Dingen als ja, leidenschaftliche Aktivistin, ähm, die keine Auseinandersetzung und keinen politischen Kampf äh, scheut. Heute bin ich sehr gespannt auf den akademischen Bereich, die akademischen Facette ihres Wirkens und ihrer wundervollen Persönlichkeit. I know Carmen above all as a passionate activist who does not shy away from confrontation and political struggle. Today I'm very curious about the academic side of your work and uh, your wonderful personality. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. And I have to say that I'm very honored for being here today. And I want to thank the organizer, and especially to my sisters from Uniromnia Collective yeah, for creating this space for us as Roma women to share our experience and knowledge. Um, coming here today, I was thinking of what my contribution should be, what should I tell you so that you can live with some ideas about the political struggles that we as Roma women face. And of course, you know, time is very limited. I am aware of that and I hope that you've been following 
the previous lectures from the other colleagues as uh, they already touched upon some issues that I will just remind uh, in short. But we can have a talk afterwards if you will be interested in, in some of the ideas that I will um, address. Now, before starting my presentation, I want to say a few words about the title, as it might sound a bit philosophical or an invitation to reimagine a world where Roma feminism have a place. Um, and you should know that internationally there are many Roma, Romnia scholars, researchers, queers, non-queers, activists and artists who are shaping uh, Roma feminism, who are developing it as a body of theory and practice. So my pledge is for placing and contextualizing this knowledge produced so that Roma feminism occupies its rightful place in uh, gender studies, theories of race, Romani studies, and you can also name, you know, other um, relevant studies. So with this, what I want to say is that Roma feminism is seen more as a, as a social and political movement and unacknowledged and subordinated as a, uh, and unacknowledged as a theory and subordinated to other movements. Right? So my presentation is a call for introducing Roma feminism as a theory and as a method to guide the future of feminism in Europe. It might sound pretentious, but <laughs> please bear with me because um, I will um, go deeper into this conversation by telling you a story which is relevant in this context because, well, uh, because I want to tackle a few elements and I think by uh, showing an example it's a bit more easy. And then second, because I promised I will not get too much philosophical with this, so <laughs> just have a bit of patience. Now, this summer I was part of a group of Romnia feminists and queers who launched a manifest which was called A Better Place for Roma LGBTQ+, in social movements. The manifest was a collective work uh, and was launched in the Pride context, which is organized every year in the summer, also in Romania, but in many parts of the world, right? And just to name some of the people who were part of this manifest, uh, there were members from the feminist collective of Romani gender experts, uh, members of Eromnia, Antonella Lerka, Sandra Selimovic, and just to name a few of, the, of them, right? Now, this manifest was written as a critic towards different practices that we witnessed in the last years where Roma feminists, queers, especially women, are being canceled or excluded from different spaces, including NGOs, and for different reasons. And I want to, to, to read some of the passages for you. And then the structure is I will try to, to I, I will analyze based on the, some elements that were um, written within the text. The text is it's maybe one, half, one page and a, and a half. I will not present all, just a few paragraphs, I promise. <coughs> But you can see the entire presentation, uh, entire manifest on the website, Eromnia. It's, the text is in English. As you know, I wear many hats. Eromnia is one of it. Well, maybe the most important of it for me, but yeah, one of the hats. So I will read the first um, text. In different countries, Roma LGBTQ plus still don't feel included in the movement nor in the prides from planning. When invited by NGOs or collectives, many of us feel scrutinized based on the gadget criteria and values. Our words are counted 
our stories are invalidated or invisible, our behavior is considered too loud and too aggressive. Some of us can join if we share the common language. Some of us, uh, if we, yes, if we share the common language, the values of respectability and presentability. For many Roma LGBTQ+, these spaces remain exclusive, elitist, and white. Now, as you can see in this passage, there are two important layers that I want to touch upon. Um, first is the gadget standards. For everybody who doesn't know, gadget means non-Roma for us in our Romani language, yes? So first is the gadget standards for getting engaged in the movements and gadget values representation towards Roma and Roma LGBTQ+, right? Now, as an activist myself, being engaged for more than 17 years in the civil society, I saw and I also felt for myself that many times we were being inquired, contested, questioned about our um, um, feminism. I've also heard many, many of my colleagues and peers saying the same, you know, sharing the same um, feelings towards, are we enough feminists, are we enough activists, are we real supporters of the LGBT plus community or other, other movements? And, you know, this was always a, um, a part of a standards, standard when we went in different spaces. The, the feeling that you are not enough and this was based mainly on the theoretical knowledge. And for me, the fact that a lot of Gaja people from the civil society have mainly theoretical knowledge and they put more value in this comparing with uh, the lived experience is an issue which is related to a privilege that a lot of, that a lot of Gaja had have comparing with Roma, right? Now, Another standard is um, knowing the international language. Many Roma feminists from communities, from the grassroots level, which I have worked in the last 12 years, have valuable experience, right? But unfortunately, they, cannot, they can never attend different international conference or bring their experiences to the table because they don't know the language. There are also um, other groups in, um, um, in other countries. Uh, for example, in Slovakia, you may, know, you may not know that there, but there is an initiative group since 2000, uh, no, si since at least 20 years, and they were involved in Poradnia, which is a Gadget NGO, and they were documenting uh, more than 200 cases of Roma women which were forced sterilization. But this initiative group remained invisible because of the lack of knowledge of a foreign language or an international language. Then, of course, there are other um, groups which remain invisible because of lack of, you know, of um, language, such as you can see there Feministas Gitanas por la Diversidad from Spain, and also other groups including in Eromnia, the, 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 the organization that I work with, right? So the fact that all of us, the, the fact that um, in all cases, there is not translated ensured, and there are no spaces to bring your own language, your native language to the table, right? Plays an important part in the way we narrate stories about Roma women, including Roma women from the grassroots level, right? But of course, not only language plays um, or, or constitutes a barrier in creative inclusive spaces. So I want to talk to you a bit about um, topics that I address in the work that I do for the last 12 years and um, which constitutes the daily reality that you have to face as a, as a Romney feminist. And some of the topics include improper uh, streets, lack of access to drinkable water, electricity, 
improper households, poor heating systems for the winter, lack of public transportation from and within the Roma communities. Now, most of the communities still don't have utilities and infrastructures, and this is something particular uh, for Roma communities. And not just in Romania, if you look at other countries from southeastern countries, from the Balkan countries, but also from western countries where it's called different, like Roma camps or ghettos, etc., where a lot of Roma are living, actually. So in most of these communities where Roma live, of course, there, you don't have in, uh, utilities, you don't have infrastructure, it takes you a lot of time to go to a doctor, you have no car, you have to carry your baby in your arms, uh, uh, and, and as I said, this, these stories are quite similar in many countries, right? Now, historically, we face discrimination. We face racism, we face social exclusion, sexism, classism, homo, lesbo, transphobia, all type of crit uh, discrimination criteria, right? But the way in which all these criteria intersect affects our daily life, our opportunities, our access to many areas. It affects the way we manifest, it affects the way we express and affirm ourselves as women. And I remember in 2012 when I was doing a research, uh, in 2021, sorry, it was pandemia, I was doing a comparative research for Romania, Finland, and Italy. And um, I remember that most of the respondents, and there were more than 60 Roma women who were responding to our, uh, to our questionnaires and to our, uh, during the interviews. And what struck me the most was that for most of the Roma women, um, the way that they heard that being Roma is so bad was in school, right? This was the first interaction. So I learned and I understood that within this, uh, this report, that it is not a singular event which decides your future, which decides your, your life as a Romney, but a sum of aggression and a, a sum of experiences of aggressions and harassments. For example, a group of Roma women dressed uh, in traditional clothes in an airport will always be double-checked, right? At shopping, the doorman will always follow you everywhere. The family doctor would not touch your child because of the dark skin, and you have to explain the degrees that you have, the school that you have, so that you know it increases your, your uh, legitimacy in front of it. When your colleagues start to make jokes about Roma using slur words, and you have to shut up. Um, when, you're, when, you, when you go in a public space in a hospital or in an institution, and you are always shut down, if your color skill is dark, right? So you learn not to respond to this, because I was talking earlier about microaggressions, and these are the type of microaggressions that you learn not to react every day. It takes so much effort, so much energy, and it takes a lot of time and space for you to react to each of these microaggressions, right? But the problem is that it's these everyday microaggressions that silence us and the refuse to support a case, the, 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 the harassment that you have uh, um, on the street as a Roma woman, the, um, um, e e even by teenagers, and I've seen many situations where teenagers were harassing uh, Roma women, the double standards that police are applying when they refuse to support victims of sexual violence or when they give fine to women for begging or for being too loud because they are, they are uh, punished. So these are the type of microaggressions that you learn not to respond, right? And this is the, these are the type of actions that we learn, that we are confronted with all the time and they are not narrated by us. And these stories that I'm telling you now create such a huge ga gap, profound, between what we show, between what we criticize, between what we represent, 
and what is actually the, the um, everyday reality for a lot of Roma, right? So this is a part of story that I feel that somehow it's forgotten in the spaces that we, uh, that we engage, right? Many times, it's, it's not acknowledged and it's not just. Now, coming back to, the, to, to some of the critics that I, that I want to, to highlight, um, let's talk about the politics of respect, uh, respectability as we are many times accused of being too loud, too aggressive, too much. I think a lot of us here can relate with this, right? So what is respectability? It's the idea of supposed worthiness of a marginalized group, right? Measured by the gadget group. For instance, if you want to get a job, you, you, ha you, you, you have to dress properly, preferably in neutral colors, to speak slowly, low tone, no? Not to have a migrant accent, this I've heard in Austria some months ago. Not to show your emotions, basically to, to, to act like a gadget, no? Now, in politics of respectability, while you are constantly confronted with negative images of, uh, of, of everything, you know, what you know about Roma, you develop strategies of self-representation, right? I'm good, I'm educated, I'm smart, right? So you distance from the imaginary Roma and become the exception from the rule. The artist, the PhD, the academic person, right? We are all exceptions. Now, Michaela Pitkin has, um, has a name for this, and it's very, something very nice that I like a lot. It's called performing a vanilla self, performing under the standards of others, self-censoring as neutral, right? And I think you've heard a lot about neutrality, especially in, in black feminism. So self-censoring as neutral in order to be accepted. If you are Of course, this can happen, this, this performing vanilla, self vanilla can happen for white passing Roma. But what is happening with those who do not pass? For those who are uh, LGBTQ+, who didn't grow up in a, in a good family, in a good home, who didn't have the privilege to go to school, who didn't starve, Right? who didn't grow up in a rural place, or in a ghetto, or in a campus, ex uh, or in a camp, etc., or who is gender non-conforming. No? Now, in politics of respectability, behaviors are judged by a group who has the power to do so, who sets the rules of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, right? by comparing with class, gender, color, and other for other criteria. Now, respectability norms reinforce races. So they, they, they reinforce transphobic actions and sections notions of appropriate behavior. While in the same time, they deny the abilities of people and their qualities, which in the end should make us different in a, and unique in a, good, in a good way. And uh, as a result, if we are keen to these values of our respectability in our movements, our movements will just become more white, heteronormative, and homogeneous, right? And this is a threat that, unfortunately, we are, we are not aware when we set up rules and values. And maybe, you know, talking about rules and values in Western countries, I think it's somehow um, um, uh, ironic, right? You can tell me more about this. I, I know a lot of rules, especially in the leftist mo uh, um, mo uh, communities. Now, to come back to the text of the manifesto, um, I want to read the following passage as it shows some of the tensions that exist within oppressed groups. 
Um, and this is another important element in my presentation, as many times as a Roma feminist, I'm accused of not being enough radical with my own community, right? And this is an example maybe to, for a lot of people to relate more with. So the passage sounds like this. We are aware of the vulnerabilities and struggles in our communities and spaces. We all share different oppression systems and fight to dismantle the power dynamics that perpetuate discrimination. By possessing a discriminating identity or sexual orientation doesn't make communities, collectives less racist or sexist. At times, there have been different allegations of racism and violence towards Roma LGBTQ plus in different spaces or stories whitewashed to be accepted, as if our voices or stories are too disturbing and must be said in such a way as to satisfy the majority's expectations. Okay, here I have to say that, you know, um, in this part, you can feel the tension, you can feel the struggle that the, the, the people who wrote the manifest put in. Right? It's not easy to criticize the norm and the practice, and this we know if we are part of communities, uh, especially when we share common experiences such as discrimination based on sexual or, or gender uh, identity. So it is a conflict, right, which places you in the position to choose between movements uh, or causes, and of course, this criteria, this uh, um, um, this critic is not new, and it's not characteristic to queer spaces. Uh, many <laughs> black feminists and Roma feminists has, have spoken out against the lack of diversity between movements. Uh, Bell Hooks, for example, in her, I'm, I'm putting here some some uh, uh, um, literature that I was. Um, inspired to for this presentation. I'm sorry if the quotations or the city is not correct. I was kind of in a hurry to be honestly. Um, so I was saying that, for example, Bell Hooks in her book, um, Feminist Theory from the Margin to Center, talks about either, uh, talks about the struggle of either racist or either feminist that many f black feminists have had uh, uh, in the uh, in the anti-racist uh, movement, right? Nicoleta Bitsu, who is a Roma activist and scholar, in her article "Personal Encounters and Parallels Towards Romani Feminism," addresses the same internal um, tensions about choosing between movements. Also, Vera Kurtic, in her book "Juvliake: Roma Lesbian Existence," speaks about how little interest in time the feminist movement has given to Roma women's rights. And then Laura Corradi goes even further and she says that, and she analyzes how little interest the queer and feminist communities have given to anti-fa, anti-racism or anti-gypsies movements, comparing with the subject uh, such as uh, migration or refugee crisis, right? We, we can debate about it afterwards if you will be interested. So, as you can see, there's a lot of criticism formulated over years, and we understand that sharing common experiences of discrimination doesn't necessarily mean that we have the same strategies, and doesn't necessarily make us, you know, um, immune to racism or to sexism. Um, in fact, Alexandra Oprah, who will lecture here in, in December, I cannot wait to, to hear, she's She's an icon for me. So Alexandra Oprah and Angela Kokce have criticized invisibility of Roma women in movements, in feminist and Roma movements, right? So it's not new and it's not a critic just towards the queer movements. And for Oprah, for example, uh, Roma women's marginalization in both movements is one of the cause of our exclusion from EU policies, which is a really serious critic that she's, she's, uh, she made in 2004, imagine, without being taken in consideration. Now, of course, I would like to, to say that 
um, there are a lot of criticism in a lot of moments, and sometimes, and, and most of them, they they continue to remain invisible. And there was a moment of uh, criticism that I want to to remind here, because after this big conference, there was a publication that you can see online. I think it's uh, somewhere. No, I didn't put it here. I'm sorry. Um, in 2015, there was a conference in Prague where about the Roma, part Roma movement participation, and there were a lot of topics addressed, such as intersectional identity, the need for diversity and alliances within the Roma movement, the invisibility of Roma women and queer people, discrimination in both Roma and non-Roma environments. And of course, there were also few conservative voices who believed that intersectionality leads to the division of the public agenda and dilutes the Roma rights movement, right? And in response, Jelena Jovanovic and Anna Ciladarovci, which again, I didn't put here, I'm sorry, um, they have a great article which is called Still Missing Intersectionality, the Relevance of Feminist Methodology in the Struggle for the Rights of Roma Studies. And they said, they argue on th that on the contrary, not having all the voices on the public agenda denotes a fragmentation as Rom of, uh, of the Roma agenda as women and men do not experience sexism, classism, anti-gypsism, or homophobia in the same way as Roma queer are experimenting, experiencing. And here, because I didn't want it to, to make out of this paragraph, you know, a session of how difficult it is and how many, much violence Roma queer people have in different movements. So I don't want to, 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 to put all this here. Uh, you can see some of the stories that I was telling you about earlier. Um, this research, which is somewhere here. No, it's not, I didn't put it. Um, ah, yes, I put it here, Challenging Intersectionality, Roma Women's Voices and Experience. It's a research that I published in 2021. It's in English, it's available on Eromnia website, and there you can find a lot of experiences uh, narrated by lesbian and transgender Roma, as well as women from, different, from these three countries that I was, we were doing this comparative analysis. I just want to, to uh, show you this um, type of, not experience, but rather feeling. Uh, what uh, one interview uh, respondent from Italy said uh, the following, I have two obstacles to overcome, that of homosexuality and that of being Roma. Consider that there is discrimination even among minorities. There are minorities of minorities. For example, I am discriminated from the Horahanie, who are usually dark, because I'm white. And then, even among LGBT+, people are racist towards Roma. In short, it's complicated. So, it's not... Um, yes? Horahanie is a um, kinship of Roma. Uh, um, we have throughout the, the Europe, maybe internationally, I'm not sure, different uh, type of kinship of Roma based on occupations that we had, right? For example, there are people who used to work with gold, with flowers, with silver, with wood, etc. Yeah, Horahane is one type of um, a kinship of Roma who, from my knowledge, used to work with leather, but we will have to double check this, yeah? Okay, now I want to come back to the last um, fragment that I want to, um, uh, to highlight before mo moving to the second part of my presentation, which formulates the standpoint of existence and difference. And the, um, the paragraph sounds as such. Our presence in the social movements should not be contingent upon fitting into white gadget standards or rainbow capitalism, but on the recognition of our diversity, experiences, 
and positions based on racial injustice. The existence of racism within the feminist and queer movement endangers our survival, not just the representation. I have to say I love this part of the text. It always makes me a bit emotional. Um, because it also addresses you know, different layers. First, it talks about how we have the struggle of fitting in, you know, the integration, which is, a, is an ongoing discussion in Europe uh, about Roma do not want to integrate, Roma do not want to, be, to, to work, Roma blah, blah, blah. You know better, I will not explain you this, right? And to me, integration means that we are taught to be part of a society in its terms, its standards. And again, we are coming back to the standards, right? And it's the same societies who ignore our history of oppression, our justice, our culture, our identities, our language. And let's not forget that countries exclude Roma from accessing their rights to welfare, to services, to infrastructure, to education, to healthcare, to justice. And again, let's not forget that Roma women have been subject to sexual violence and harassment in public spaces, and so often police didn't intervene to protect them. Also, let's not forget that there have been racial attacks, hate crimes, taken place in countries like Hungary, Spain, Finland, Greece, Italy, also Western countries, not just Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, right? And there is uh, last year, OSCE, which is the Organization for Security and Cooperation, they were uh, publishing a report where they were saying that 13 states from Europe have reported in the last year hate crimes against Roma. Yeah, and you can see there a lot of information about different type of, uh, uh, of hate crime. And again, let's not forget that historical context of slavery, of Holocaust, of colonialism creates social injustice, social inequalities that for us are still not acknowledged. And of course, coming back to the, um, to the paragraph, there's another thing about this text which strikes every time. It reminds us, it reminds me that we fight for life, we fight for survival. And it's sad. And it is unjust. Of course, in the last 20 year, decades, many Roma activists, feminists, and queers have done so much work in Europe, to, to, uh, in Europe and internationally, no? in also outside Europe, to um, put Roma on the agenda, including me. And we all through academic knowledge, activism uh, work, political work, political art. We are producing epistemic knowledge. We are building transnational coalitions. We produce uh, art and we represent issues. We occupy spaces, we break boundaries, we challenge the normative identities of Roma, right? But most important, I think, what we brought in Europe's agenda was all topics, the basic needs, right? So the world is moving to climate activism, to organic food and LGBT representation, equal pay. And we, or the, on the other hand, are struggling in different fields with different strategies to hold societies and governments accountable for basic needs. Water, electricity, force eviction, better houses, proper roads, but also access to services of sexual and reproductive justice, of uh, shelters for victims of gender-based violence or forced sterilization. I mean, 
Yes, you can go back and you'll see the text says, the text really says, we are not acknowledged, right? So, this was a long story, right? Are you all doing okay? <laughs> Everybody's good? Okay. <laughs> I want to draw some conclusions in this last part of uh, my presentation and just to, <clears throat> to recap some of the issues that I addressed here, just for everybody to make it, I don't know, more accessible and easy to remember, yes? So I addressed historical oppression, basic needs, gadget standards, politics of respectability, <coughs> tensions to choose between causes, uh, sorry, yeah, should I continue? No, 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 no. Yeah? I don't know what happened. Okay. So Did I, I, I didn't do nothing. This just gives me time. I am, everything is fine, thank you. <laughs> is it, um, I, I, I it's just a technical issue, but I will I will continue. Um, yeah. Okay. It it looks like it's uh, it, it did something. Okay. So just to recap some of the topics that I addressed, I was talking about historical oppression, about basic needs, gadget standards, mm -hmm. politics of respectability, the tensions between choosing from different yeah from different causes and movements. The critic from inside the movement, the marginalization in all movements, and finally the failure of intersectionality, right? And I believe that these elements that I discussed today are part of the, def the, of the definition of Roma feminism as a theory, uh, as a feminist theory, and as a movement. So this conclusion that I'm stating now, it's based on the, yeah, it's working great. <laughs> so this conclusion is based on, on the work that I've done in the last 22 years to while I was doing a lot of um, project management. I was building a lot of, uh, my, uh, my, basically my entire work is, is built on working with women and, and girls, but I was also studying, researching, teaching, following the work of many other Roma women, researchers, feminists, and activists, and also in conversations with them. So there's a list of conclusions that I have, which is withdraw from all this amount of work that has been happening, right? And which doesn't belong just to me, just to make it clear, right? But so I'm proposing a set of characteristics which defines uh, Roma feminism as a theory, and um, yeah, and these are, are 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 some of some of them, which I'm hoping that they will get critic. I'm hoping that they will be at some point taken over, criticized, and developed in something that has always been developed, right? Feminism. Um, one of the characteristics that I, 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 um, I fully um, appreciate is the fact that Roma feminism is articulated, articulates its claims based on social inequalities, on social realities and hierarchies that Roma women are facing, right? Then that Roma feminism is developed as a form of resistance towards the standards, the gadget standards that I was earlier <laughs> developing more of. It is developed as a critic to norm and practice from inside the group, whether we talk about feminist, queer, etc and it challenges the dominant narrative of we Roma. It places always, it is placed always in tension, and you can also see it as a sort of loyalty, right? Between anti-racist fight, sexism, classism, or queerness, 
but we, it can also be something else, of course. And of course, it uses intersectionality as a tool to dismantle power relation, oppressive system, which makes identities uh, vulnerabilities. Then it is positioned. It develops from the marginalized voices of women, right, and LGBTI plus we, inside the Roma, but it also develops as the marginalized theory in different movements, right? So it's the margin of the margin, if bell hooks would be here, would probably say that it's this clear. <laughs> um, what else? Yes, it uses activism and political art to generate knowledge. For a long time, the fact that we have Romnia activist and feminism feminists involved in, in, the, in the social movements, and, and they created a lot of knowledge which is still unacknowledged as a body of theory, which is something that I'm pleading for, right? Of course, it, it claims knowledge based on collective experiences of racism, of discrimination, of sexism, etc. And um, something important that I, I, I was probably mentioning before, but Romnia, Rom, Roma feminism is um, positioned in interaction with the Gaj world, whether it's queer, whether it's uh, feminist, right? So this type of positionality creates experiences and create, unveils also new questions for power, for roles, for oppression systems, for racism, and, and, and it's an immense, immense amount of work that a lot of uh, Roma feminists have done in this area, which I think should be categorized at some point. Now, from my opinion, Roma feminism is not just a political and a social movement. It is a theory and it is a method it has epistemic knowledge. And whether it is based on personal stories or collective stories, Roma feminism doesn't come from representing is representation issues, but from social realities, right? And um, this is practically my, my plea for, you know, start to take it as, as, as it is, as a, as a, as a theory. Now, Just a small, maybe in the breaks, because maybe I was touching upon intersectionality many, many times, uh, but not fully, um, I, 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 not addressing it clearly. Of course, it is a buzzword in, in many of our movements nowadays, but unfortunately, as, as I was saying before uh, about the failure of intersectionality, there, there is no profound implication in social movements, in policies, or in justice system in, in Europe. And of course, a lot of work and a lot of uh, knowledge about intersectionality the black feminists has, have produced. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw has a wonderful um, a presentation that she was giving for University Brown, I think it was in 2015, where she talks about the failure of intersectionality, and I, it, it would, it's amazing to, to hear her and to hear her thoughts about it. And also Patricia Hill Collins, who, who was also um, writing and producing knowledge about it. And um, what I love about both of them is that they criticize the fact that interne intersectionality has become uh, uh, um, um, a, de a term used or it ha has become something where you are counting your identities, no? And it's, it's not this, no, like counting all your identities and seeing that how many, checking all the boxes, it's not intersectionality, right? And it's so much tied to power relation, to systems and structures, and how they interact with people, and then how they d determine injustice, right? Because of their, uh, inter if their identities, who become vulnerabilities. And of course, intersectionality is um, 
um, is, a, is a theory that Roma feminists would use a lot and would be used also a lot in other movements. So this was my, you know, like giving importance to this theory which produced so much uh, benefits for a lot of groups, ethnic or other groups. Now, coming back to my conclusions, uh, um, because the title was A Place for Roma Feminism, <laughs> I'm thinking that um, Roma feminism is a theory, uh, as a theory, sorry, is placed between past, present, and future. And in my presentation, I tried to address both, right? The past and also the present. But I'm leaving now for the last part, the, the future of feminist, as, as I think the future of feminist has to be a future, uh, has to be one which includes Roma feminism as a theory and I think as, it, as an uncomfortable as it is, without criticism, we would not see other perspectives, which makes a lot of difference. So even if people are feeling uncomfortable, stay with this feeling because it, it, you, you are in a good place, a place. So as an idea for future, as some conclusions for the future, I think, we must continue to criticize the dominant narrative Roma as it made women and queer invisible in political agenda for a long time. Within this context, we need to strengthen alliances between Roma women and LGBT plus as they become important voices that challenge the dominant narrative, Roma, the heteronormativity, right? The women's position, the gadget world. So you already you know, see how much amount of sources you have to, to build upon. We must continue to criticize who produces knowledge about Roma women in academia, about Roma LGBT plus in academia, dominated by white Westerners and sometimes Roma gay men where lesbians and transgenders are missing. And this we must acknowledge and criticize. We must denounce the representation of Roma women as threat and as a danger for society as it has historical roots which serves as an excuse for anti-Roma racism. And we must continue to work and fight for a uh, fight against racism, against fascism or Roma phobia. So these are some, some of the, not, not, not just conclusions, but thoughts for the future, as most of the time when we talk about you know, how, we are, how we are developing something that it's live and it's so dynamic. And, um, what I want to say, and with this I will close, is that most of the time uh, the, the, the social movements and the political movements are, are, are underrated, are under acknowledged, because you know, it's about projects, it's about organizations, and it's not true. And what I've tried, in the, uh, what I've argued in the last hour is that all this knowledge, wonderful knowledge, which is built, right, this epistemic knowledge was built by creating art, by creating culture, by creating project, by creating, right? By contributing and being engaged in different movements. And, and the last thing, uh, thought about uh, my, my, interven my lecture is that, because you may ask yourself, why would I talk about a manifest, which is you know, something as an initiative coming from a group of people which are furious that there are still mechanisms and practices happening in our spaces. And I just want to say two, word, two things. And first, it has a lot of implications in policies at EU or national, in law, in access to services, in justice, right? The effect of us being uh, uh, the subject of this type of practices is, is part of a larger, top, uh, larger topic and larger practice, right, that we are facing. And second, because I believe that in any situation in which Roma, Romnia are excluded, we must start talking about it. We must start publishing it without shame. Because in the end, communities need to learn how to handle criticism, and we need to start changing the structures, right? So, thank you.
Thank you so much for this amazing lecture. Um, jetzt ist Raumzeit für Fragen auf Deutsch, auf Englisch. Das Mikro ist hier vorne. Ist leider leer. Okay, was machen wir jetzt? Oh, and we okay. need a microphone because okay. of okay. the I, translation. I ah, yes, translation. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You can, uh, in this time, you can think about your question, please. <laughs> Checking your feelings. <laughs> Or you come in the front, <laughs> yes. you come here and speak, because we need um, to speak in microphone because of the translation. <laughs> If somebody wants <laughs> to come, you can come here and speak in the microphone. The question? Ah, okay. Great. <laughs> Maybe we'll we'll do it Okay, test, test. So, questions? Super. <laughs> Fragen? Okay. Fragen. Questions. Comments. <laughs> Anything. Okay, whatever. <laughs> um, so, hi. Uh, thanks, it was amazing, of course. What else? Um, no, it was really good, really good. Um, Okay, so my question is, wait, I wrote it down. Um, um, when you talk about the failure of intersectionality, right? Um, like what I kind of like missed or like maybe didn't get, but you're talking about the failure of um, that we as Roma fail to apply intersectionality within our community? Or are you talking about that the intersectional feminist movement, which is basically, it was once a black movement, it turned into being used by the whites completely, and now it's kind of an empty, shallow word almost, because, yeah, it's at least what I like, everything that comes from the grassroots turns into university, mm -hmm. and then somehow it loses uh, the, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, so you know what I mean. And uh, so this critique you had, was it that the academic or intersectional feminist movements are like m missing out on us, or that we don't apply intersectionality mm. on us? Because in my, like my position is that, um, we always have lived intersectionality, like by doing it, you know, we didn't yeah. like maybe study it, yeah. but we actually practiced it, you know, like, yeah. so what's your take on it? That's my question. <laughs> thank you. And my comments and everything. Basically. Yes, thank you for this, these reflections, really. Um, I, I, would, I would say first that, you know, The, the failure of intersectionality is not uh, like a, a group's problem. It's everybody's problem, right? So all movements failed to apply intersectionality in this way. No? And I was saying before that it became a cool word to use, right, in different contexts and to start counting on your identities, but without um, applying it, for and, and I've been asked many times, like, how do you apply this in different spaces, for example? And that's why I was addressing standards, because you, 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 you are engaged in different spaces which are technically intersectional, but they don't apply the standards of intersectionality, right? They, they, they apply, they continue to apply the same rules, the white gadget rules. And intersectionality is in conflict with these standards, right? And 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 this is um, this is this is why I think that uh, the feminist movement has failed 
to become to become intersectional as well as queer movement as well as Roma movement and I think that's why I'm saying that I, I think it's actually the failure of all movements which is sad yeah and then yeah I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure if I responded to the other co comment you, you had a comment about um, Was it another comment besides intersectionality? Well, I mean, I said that we already live it without, like, ah, we yes. study it. Thank you for reminding me. Like, yes. Uh, how always, like, in my eyes. Yes. And it becomes a theory, but we actually practice it, like, and not only Roma women, but. Yes, exactly. I, I was saying in the, the first part of my presentation that. For example, what I noticed in, in the civil society is that a lot of activists are used, are, have a lot of theoretical background, right? Mm -hmm. And they put a lot of value in this. Yeah. And then the lived experience is devalued somehow. And, and, and the lived experience is basically, you know, it, uh, means that a lot of BPOC people, Roma, or people with other d uh, abilities, etc., no queer people, etc., are actually here so all their experiences is devalued because of the lack of theoretical knowledge and many of us have felt this while being here so yes i think it's um it um it it, 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 it is part of a yeah somehow a standard which is still unacknowledged and it's also unaddressed and as uncomfortable as it is to criticize different movements I am a feminist, who, I, and I've been engaged in the feminist movement since 2006 in my country. So I, I can say that I, you know, I, I contributed. I was there building it. But then I cannot say that the reverse happened as well, right? You see always less in, involvement from the other side when you have your own causes, like anti-racism, no? or fight against police violence, or fight against you know, police lack of uh, involvement when, it t when it's about uh, women, victims of gender-based violence, etc. So you don't see the, the opposite. And then you start questioning, is it really intersectional just because I am in a white gadget space, or it, should it be from both sides? You know? And then another thing is that, of course, you know, for a lot of Roma and, and BPOC people, if they don't have enough knowledge about all this theoretical background of intersectionality, like, you don't have space there to talk about, you know, ideas and, yeah. I just wanted to add something when you said intersectionally is, interse the, the term intersectionality is being used um, so inflationary, right, from different movements. Um, yeah, just had a mind. It's um, it happens here in in Germany as well, and it's I, for my understanding, I think intersectionally applies when you you have to have the term racism, like you have to be affected at least from racism. But it ha it's being used from a lot of movement. For instance, um, when it's about reproductive rights white women that say, okay, I'm a woman and I'm also disabled. So that's for them intersectionality. So the, I just wanted to agree with you and it's happening here also. And it gets me upset sometimes as well that um, it takes away somehow the power of, the, of this term. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And Kimberly Crenshaw has a wonderful presentation, very angry about this topic, you know, where, where she talks about if you consider yourself intersectional, but you exclude the, the race, you know, issue, it's like you devalue all the work that a black woman has produced since the 90s, right? And it's like invisibilizing, whitewashing, no? In a way. So it's, yeah. And, but unfortunately, I also feel that in Europe, we don't talk so much about it. It's like we passed these topics already. We are in an, I don't know, somehow in a postmodern era where these topics are beyond us. We managed to solve, to check all the, everything, <laughs> no, of this. 
I, f I feel like I live in this area, even though I don't, I don't see the improvements, but I feel like, oh, everybody passed by to this topic, you know. That's why I, I always like, for example, to go back to the topic of basic needs. You know, Roma are still struggling with basic needs, people, like not having water, not having proper roads, not having uh, light, electricity, which is insane. And then you see that the world is moving to all these technologies, which, which is amazing, right? Yeah. But it's like such a big gap which creates between the poor people, which just by default happens to be more, m most of them Roma, right? It's, yeah. So I think, yes, it's, please, no, if. More question, <laughs> comments? You can also disagree with me, please. Oh. I would like this more. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> hey, so first, thank you for the intervention. It was really good, really appreciated. And something that was also important to me is like the idea that theory is only made in academies. Mm -hmm. So how can we de-academicize the theory? How we can like f not forget that it's not only important what we are doing here in classes, in rooms, but it's really important what is happening outside, in the streets, in the with the people, so. Well, one well, excellent comment. Thank you for this. I, I, this is something that I'm, I've been talking and writing. Also, part of my PhD was about this many years ago, as you know, you feel that um, knowledge production happens in an, in this uh, academic right environment, which is filled with all these theories and knowledge, and most of the time, you know, actually. <coughs> Empirical knowledge comes from connection with people, from their experiences, right? That's why, I mean, myself, I am uh, more in favor of um, the standpoint feminism, which is based on women's experiences and from their voices and from their, exp their experiences, which creates a uh, theory of knowledge. But of course, it's just uh, one side. But related to your question, how we can start to, I don't know, de debug, dismantle this maybe, you know, just think about it. I think we need to change the standards of what is academia, no? This is something that we have to... Why you know. we are in academia? <laughs> Why we are in the academia, let's start thinking of this. <laughs> I mean, it's not, of course, it's not something e e easy to do, but it's, if, you, if you think about it from a perspective of a person which is from the other side, like the non-dominant group, right? All the rules that have been created here were created mainly by white men, no? Very little women were feminist, right? From since maybe 70s, 80s, I don't know. Okay, thanks a lot for, for a great speech and I would like to continue on, on this point where we arrive now about, because you said many important things about um, collectively generated knowledge in mm -hmm. movement. So, and how to, how to disrupt these academic uh, ways of making knowledge. And what, what I see as a problem <laughs> is that many people you know, some people make it from um, minority groups and from movements, mm -hmm. they make it into academia. And in order to make it inside, they need to subscribe to many rules and to yeah. play by the rules. Then they are inside as individuals. And many, I'm, I'm not talking now about Roma people, I'm, I'm not Roma myself, I'm, I'm talking about other, uh, all other Okay, minorities okay. and <laughs> activists in academia. <laughs> and many of them then continue playing to those rules when, once mm -hmm. they are inside. Mm -hmm. And they start creating knowledge about the others on the outside. So this is, I mean, people have written about this. Uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? What do you do once you are inside as, as, a, as an individual? Mm. How do, you know, there, I know there are many answers to this, but I think this is a really important point. Like, how do we disrupt this, this uh, tradition of how knowledge is produced 
once when you, when you finally enter that system, like that ivory tower, and uh, and theoretically you should have possibilities there, mm. and many activists don't use those possibilities; they become another academic, mm. for, in 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 a negative sense. Mm. I I. Uh, I will give you an example of um, what is a bit what is the environment now in in Romania. So we have gender studies, and probably you know that in many southeastern countries, but maybe also western countries, gender studies are under attack, right? As uh, they are related to gender identity, so there there are all these groups which are targeting the gender studies, and they are asking that they should be taken out of the curricula, right, uh, in the university. And uh, this is a science, it's a social science, which is studied for many, many years, right, at least 30 years, especially in, in different universities. In, in Romania, it has a younger history, maybe since the 90s, 90s, 98, I'm not sure. But I know that there is a constant struggle, even if it is, uh, uh, acknowledged as a social science and its study and it has its department in an university, it is constantly under pressure of um, being something, of producing, of having the good allies with deans, with the management, so that you, 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 have, you can still you know, maintain this. So when I'm thinking of how difficult it is, for example, for gender studies, which have already a long history, and still they are under threat of being uh, uh, banned in different universities. I mean, in Hungary, it already happened, right? And there is all this rhetoric, yes, coming from other parts about not to study um, this specific science. And there are also a lot of voices from the Gaje male in universities who say that it's not a real science, that women who are teaching there are not really academic are not really women who studied something. So it's a lot of devaluation in this. And I, and I, I look at how much struggle it is for these professors in, in, in departments in, in my country. And I'm thinking, to come back to your question, how would it look for a Roma academic, a singular person in a university with no department? Just the person who's coming here and everybody sees suddenly that it, it's a Roma you know, uh, academic or a professor. How, how would it change the structure? I think we have to really challenge the power that people have individually. And as we see, we live in a context where even structures are under attack, because I was giving this example with the gender studies. So my, my thought on this is that if you have individuals, Roma academics who are teaching, they, they would not have the, the power to change structures, to be honest. And this is, of course, it's a, it's, it's a sad reality, but also um, thinking that we should put a lot of responsibility on them and that they, one person should change the entire system, the entire structure, this is also unfair. Um, when I'm criticizing, I'm expecting that the environment starts to acknowledge this and starts to change. So, you know, at some point we have to start shifting a bit from individual perspective, which is also kind of le right, right, like liberal idea that one person is going to change this university or <laughs> the university where I'm teaching in Bucharest would not be possible. But it is more the responsibility of the institution. And this is something that I'm pl pledging for so that they, they start to change the, the system. We, m we must also start to, to, to shift the perspective from it's not me who has to change the society of racism, it is not my problem because society is racist, it's society's problem that it's racist and it has to start dealing and to act on, on it. So, yeah, I don't know if this <laughs> satisfies the idea that, you know, but I, I'm, I'm also not in favor of Roma individuals, heroes, who it would uh, change systems because, a as we've seen, it didn't happen, no, until now. I mean, I'm I'm here since more than 20 years, and 
I, I didn't see. I, I see a lot of individual, smart individuals. I am also one of it, but I didn't manage to change nothing, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, hi. Um, but maybe you are a heroine for someone, like for me. I don't know, because I think that um, the mere presence of like Roma mm -hmm. professors or other minorities in academia is already, like it has an effect, I think. At maybe for the next generation or for the society we are building and maybe I'm just too idealistic but I don't really care so <laughs> I will just tell you one experience that I had um, I'm not Roma but you know mm -hmm. I think it applies to other minorities as well because I think adaption is also like a mechanism to survive in academia so yes I don't know you know we have to mm -hmm. adapt or I don't yeah to survive but also this activist pra practice can be like, I don't know, a treasure hold to like f also to resist, but also to like uh, contribute to epistemic, you know, like to, to, to create knowledge. And I think also just the presence of a person who survives in that kind of academia can already be like, um, like a fight against epistemic violence. Because what I really, really experienced in my career, I'm just surviving in academia, <laughs> is that, for example, when you, um, like you are creating knowledge because you participate in a study and then you as a migrant are sent to other migrant organizations to ask about their experience. All of them, it was here at Humboldt University, everyone told me about discrimination, that they are, discrim like they are experiencing it. So when we are in a quality qualitative study, this should be mentioned in the study results. And it was like declined to mention it. And this happened not only in this case, it happened in many cases. So I think just to have someone that would listen and like would accept this kind of result as a professor or doctor is already a, like a huge step forward. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a big potential and I know that it's a burden because it's individuals, but I think it's, it is like an heroic act to survive in that kind of super wide academia. And in this elitist spaces, I mean, you. Yeah. So thank you for that work. Yeah. No, also thank you for the, the comment. I fully agree with you. I, I, it, it, it is not less important that we are here as individuals surviving in, in white academia, of course. I would say it's not enough. Maybe we always, I always have to question my own um, expectations, right? It's also because you, know, you, you feel that some changes have, have to happen. I mean, I've had a situation, I'm teaching since five years in university, a, a, a course on, on the master degree about Roma feminism. And I've been accused by different white male professors that I'm bringing the Black Lives Matters into their university, that I'm going to bring black and Roma literature in their university, and that I'm going to promote uh, taking out the statues, uh, uh, taking down the statues in, in Bucharest. So I, this, and it was in a public meeting, not in a private conversation. So, I mean, of course, it is an act of survival. It is not enough. It should not be heroic that it is happening like this. But also my expectations as, as an activist, as an academic, uh, is to to see some changes happening. I'm, I'm also tired of showing all the time, you know, um, dramatic stories of Roma so that I convince you, everyone, that this is a matter of life and death and you have to do something and you have to change something, you know. That's why I'm, I, I decided not to come with a presentation about how difficult the life of Roma women is. I could tell you hundreds of stories about this, but it's just like, you know, if you want to hear this, there's a lot of, report research produced about a lot of people and you have the access to 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 get this information i also think it's important to start criticizing when you're inside you know and it even if it's not comfortable to reflect about it yeah it comes from a position of a lot of research and work that i that i've been doing but thank you for your your comment i i, I also fully agree with it i have to say yeah <laughs> okay. yes, uh, yes. I, I am interested in um, the manifest you told us. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the history of of that manifest and who um, 
who um, participated and how is the distribu distribution of the manifest? I'm interested. Well, um, the, the manifest has, a, has some very personal stories about different uh, Romnia queers who have been excluded in times and about different practices that existed in queer spaces against Roma transgender as they are not respect, respectful enough to represent, to be part of, which was very problematic. And it was, you know, when we decided to have this manifest, it was a moment of angerness. And, and for me, I, I wrote an article some years ago, um, which is called Lift Up Your Skirts, and is based on this, uh, you know, image representation of Roma women uh, in the media who always lift up their skirts when they are when when the police is marching in their houses on their communities right and and you ha we have a lot of this narrative in in romania maybe you don't have i see that you are looking a bit strange at me now <laughs> but i have a lot of this representation in my country of women being angry and and lifting their skirts right and um i was writing an article about why angerness is a powerful tool against people who apply systematic violence, right? And, and in the same way, when we wrote this manifest, it was a moment of political angerness, right, against these uh, practices. I, I don't want to share in this uh, moment these uh, stories as they are quite, uh, you know, violent. Uh, yes, exactly. But, but, but always from this type of practices, which you would believe that it's like, you know, just a moment happening, but you, you feel that Roma women are constantly scrutinized for being not enough part of the movement or not enough feminist or et cetera. I, I, I think it, it was a moment to take a stance and to, to have a critic. And we wrote this manifest. We collected more than 50 signatures just from Roma, LGBT and Roma allies of the movement. And um, we send it this manifest to different European uh, structures where they deal with feminism and LGBTQ uh, plus issues. And then, you know, we also had a lot of some debates in, in different spaces about how uncomfortable it was to receive this type of criticism and what are you doing with it now, right? How do you build collectives which are more inclusive and which distance from this type of practices which I consider really racist and, and violent. And then we also organized our own Roma pride because it was, you know, because the Roma were completely missing this year from, from the Pride, not just in, in Bucharest, but in other cities. And it was such a strong moment to, to, to go and see that there are no Roma on the stage, that there are no Roma experiences, that you don't have Roma events on the, you know, in the, uh, during the weeks when they are organizing a lot of stuff for the Pride. It was uh, very painful also to see that, you know, being part of the movement Actually, it means that just some people who are the role models, who are the good people can attend, who are respectable and have enough knowledge to take part, but not everybody, it's not for everybody. So intersectionality doesn't work like this. It's not just for some people who are more, right? So we organized also a Roma Pride with some events, with some debates that we also uh, live streamed. Thank you for this. <laughs> reminder that it's <laughs> late and we have to wake up. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think in, in, in a way, you know, criticizing, creating alternatives, but also uh, trying to recover what is left from different communities, it's, it's important. Because my pledge here is not for not being part of movements and creating your own alternatives of Roma pride, right? My, the, the, my pledge is uh, for inclusivity, for intersectionality, uh, for work with collectives. And sometimes to start rebuilding it, if you see that the, the mechanism created in the meanwhile or the practices are not, not in line with what should be. Yeah. Uh, 
okay, last uh, thing for me, I guess. Um, when you talk about respect... Stability. Yes, exactly. Um, and you talked about all the rules, and those were gotcha rules, you know, but so I have then two questions. When we talk then, like, do you think, okay, like, let me phrase that differently. Those, because we have different communities, no? Mm -hmm. Like, also, like, I'm basically hopping from PSC communities to queer communities to left communities, blah. Everywhere, I'm usually the only one, like, Maybe I have a sister there or two, but even like in the PSC communities, uh, we are basically not represented, you know what I mean? So anyways, when you say about this respectability, uh, we're talking, and the, and the gotcha minority, we're talking, you apply the same t towards, because it's a difference whether you're in a white queer space or whether you're in a PSC space. Mm -hmm. Um, would you say it's kind of the same-ish because, yeah, even as you understand what I mean, right? And then also those rules that we are talking about, especially from white uh, gotcha spaces only, those rules are usually not written down. You understand what I mean? This is something that really always pisses me off, to be honest, because everyone expects you to behave a certain way, to speak a certain, to look, like all of what you, but they never wrote them down, like, you know, you don't get a playbook or something. So if you're not being brought up in that habitus, in those circles, in those class, let, let's call it a class, yeah, mm -hmm. then you have to fail, you know? It's, it's an obligation, you cannot, yeah, you have to fail. I mean, I fully relate with you. I've been the only person in the room for such a long time. It's like the, the, the story of a lot of Roma, you know, feminist and queer people in different spaces. You are almost the only person somewhere, which creates always a discomfort. But you have to, th that's why I wrote this, this, the, the, this paper, exactly, and also this manifestation, ma manifest, to show that the fact that you don't have more Roma in different movements, it's because of these standards, which are most of the time not written down, as you very well pointed out. Thank you. I will also <laughs> have to adapt my, my lecture with this. But, no, but to be honestly, yes, it, it's part of the having the power. You know? I mean, people who have the power don't have to write down the rules. No? You have to obey them, you have to start you know, sh showing and uh, uh, behave in a, in a way of copying right, the others when you don't have rules written. And then again, if rules are written down but there were no you know, Roma, BPOC people at the table, it's again, a con right? You are again contesting the, the why are these type of rules? Is it okay to have just these rules? But to, to answer also your comment about other movements than the white, I, I'm not, I don't know Romanian space, it's quite white. So we don't have BPOC groups, movements. And, and we, of course we have Roma, but that's about it. So I would not say, but I'm, so I'm not sure if these rules or applies to this and I would not want to, yeah, maybe. Thank you, Carmen, so much for your lecture, you. for your coming. Thank you. And you promised you will come back in summertime. Oh, yes. So we have to organize the new uh, Uni Romnia in summertime in yes. Berlin. <laughs> Looking forward to see you. Und ich freue mich auf nächste Woche. Wir haben Magda Matatsche nächste Woche mit einem Vortrag hier ähm, aus den USA eingeflogen. Ähm, Anti, der Titel ist Anti-Roma Racism History Pillars Legacies Present Day, Present Day Manifest Manifestations and Intersectional Approach. Also es knüpft an und ähm, ja, ich freue mich, wenn ihr sie wieder reichlich in Präsenz hier seid. Und wer noch Flyer mitnehmen möchte und verteilen möchte, ähm, da vorne 
Wir freuen uns, wenn die noch weiter verteilt werden. Vielen Dank.